Good afternoon, everyone. How you all doing? Yeah, it's a great turnout today. Thank you so much for coming to celebrate our last What Matters to Me and Why of the year. It's been a great year, our 13th year. And I'm so you know grateful to see such a strong turnout. I was telling Norbert, though, that it really must be a testament to his mentorship and his um, uh, you know the esteem that his students hold him in as a professor to see so many people, undergraduates, graduates, staff, professors here. So thank you for coming out. Please grab some food if you haven't. Uh, I just want to shamelessly plug a few upcoming events before we begin. Tomorrow, Office of Religious Life is co-sponsoring an event with the Polymath Society called The Shoah Can It Be Studied? It'll be an event focusing on how do we understand evil? How do we understand the Holocaust? Um, it's going to be at 5 p.m. Uh, tomorrow, Doheny Memorial Library, room 241. It'll feature Marty Kaplan, Stephen Smith, and some other great folks from our campus. So uh, please check it out if you can. Uh, next Thursday, April 11th, is The Spirit of the Law, our last one of the year at the law school featuring Professor Alex Lee. That's at 12.30 p.m. in room 7. Uh, it's a free lunch, um, so please join us for that. April 12th, uh, next Friday, we're doing Soul Screen Film Festival. It's USC's first spiritual film festival. Uh, we're showing a bunch of fi feature films and shorts from 2 p.m. to 10 p.m. at the School of Cinematic Arts, room 108. Uh, the, the feature films will be Kumare by Vikram Gandhi, who will be here, and uh, Crazy Wisdom by Lisa Lehman, who will also be here. And finally, on April 17th, um, at the Forum Room at 7 p.m., we're hosting a book release for Anomaly. It's the largest full-color graphic novel ever released. It has, it's a sort of multimedia platform. Uh, it's written by some incredible people, including Skip Brittenham, who's uh, one of the world-leading uh, entertainment attorneys, and Brian Haberlin, who did Spawn and Witchblade. It was recently um, optioned for a film. Uh, so please check it out. We'll talk about the future of graphic novels and film and digital media. It should be a great event. It's free and open to the public, and you can RSVP at Spectrum. Um, lastly, how many graduating, um, un how many undergraduates are graduating here this year? Wonderful. So I'd like to invite you all to our baccalaureate ceremony. It's at 5 p.m. on May 16th. It happens the day before commencement. It's our annual multi-faith celebration of commencement. This year we have a wonderful keynote speaker, Krista Tippett, Peabody award-winning journalist. Uh, she has a show called On Being, which is on NPR about faith and spirituality and creativity. Um, and we really look forward to hosting her. So that's 5 p.m. at Bovard. It's free and open to the public. All students and parents are invited. It's a great way to spend uh, an evening with your family um, on the eve of, uh, back of commencement. So um, th that being said, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our student, Arvind Iyer, who's a student of the Interfaith Council. He's really interested in spirituality and science, and he'll be introducing our special guest speaker today. So please join me in welcoming Arvind Iyer. Thank you, Dean Sony. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, when Dean Sony suggested that I introduce Norberto, one option was to do what everyone does uh, while doing an introduction for an accomplished scientist and educator, which is to go online and look at their magnificent CVs. But I thought there's another place which would give us a better close-up look. And where I did go was his students' PhD dissertations. I looked at the dedication pages. And here is what one of them said. And this captures what so many of us feel about Norberto. Norberto is a role model of a scientist whose intelligence dazzles me with aesthetic pleasure. In addition, I'm thankful for the company of Norberto, the human being, with an endless source of warmth, optimism, encouragement, and energy. Here's what one more student had to say. I thank my advisor, Norberto, for, besides all his intellectual guidance, his endless encouragement on what I have done during the times when I was discouraged by what I could not have done. From those impressions, you might think it's not just a mentor we are talking about, but a life coach of some kind. And you would be right. Being a coach is something that comes naturally to Norberto. In fact, he has been a soccer coach for the girls' high school soccer team at Palos Verdes High, he has also played soccer for the USC Witterby professors team, and he's also a proud Trojan dad, twice over. Ever since I joined the lab in 2009, I have never ceased to be amazed by how much he manages to get done in a day. 
how does a day in the life of Norberto the professor looks, look like? So here's a journal entry from somewhere in April 2010. Today was a busy Monday for me, but a busier Monday still for Norberto. He started off with a faculty meeting in the morning, then supervised an experiment with turtles in the anatomy section, chaired a joint meeting with a collaborator lab, and shortly thereafter provided a guided tour to a group of high school students. And will spend the rest of the day fine tuning some lectures he'll deliver tomorrow. All of this without ever searching for words or snapping an impatience. For me, Idleness vanishes, resolve strengthens, and action galvanizes by simply watching him. Besides learning how to do science with a smile, in the lab we have also learned to sing happy birthday to you in Portuguese. <laughs> uh, Portuguese happens to be one of at least five languages he's fluent in. Helping people connect across barriers of language, terminology, and specialization is something that's second nature to Norberto. We have seen him in action in a number of interdisciplinary neuroscience lecture series where he's a course coordinator, where we are in a room full of a baffling array of experts, anatomists, neurophysiologists, psychologists, computer scientists, electrical engineers, where he always manages to make sure that everyone in the room understands what's being said. During these lectures, he delights being seated among the students, ever curious, always a student at heart. He says that he sees today's talk as a way to get closer to the students and help us all bridge our intellectual lives to our personal and spiritual ones. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming this lover of learning and builder of bridges, Professor Norberto Grievitz. Wow, Arvin, this was an amazing introduction. I, did I, do I really do all of that? <laughs> I, um, I, I, I thank Arvin so much. I mean, Arvin and I have gone a long way together. He has been a student in my classes. He has been a TA in my courses. He's also in the lab, uh, you know, my lab. And, you know, uh, besides and above being a student, I, I consider Arvin my friend. Um, and a very deep person. I, I think, actually, you would have been better here than I would. <laughs> Next time, please invite Arvin. <laughs> I uh, also want to thank Dean Sony and, of course, the selection committee. This is um, quite um, an honor, but more than an honor, you know, we, we, we are so busy all the time and we have no time to think um, sometimes, you know, as, as chair of the department, I have to deal with lots of things. Um, and. Uh, often wish I have time to stop and think. And I, in fact, this invitation helped me because I had to stop and think what matters to me and uh, try to put this in a coherent way. And finally, I'd really like to thank you, the students. I mean, I, I, I am touched. I mean, I, I see students from my classes since um, many years uh, here, undergrads and graduate students. And, uh, um, you know, I, I always say that my goal is not so much to give knowledge, but to inspire. And, um, I, I, you know, I'm hoping maybe I can inspire today. I, I, I'm hoping you came here not to throw eggs at me, but actually to, to listen to the story. So the poster says um, that I am going to tell you about what matters to me as a scientist, and I will. Um, but I think it's important for you to understand why, what matters to me to have a context of my life. So I want to cast this in, um, in the context of my life uh, so you understand um, what matters to me. Um, also because I think what matters to any of us keep changing um, and it's important to understand how they change as I went forward. So I'd like to start with two events from my youth um, that I think have a big impact on how I think and act today. The first has to do with my grandmother, maternal grandmother, uh, Buba Pola, or Bobe Pola um, in Yiddish. So um, she was um, a woman who lived uh, in Uruguay, um, south of the border from Brazil. I was born and raised in Brazil. Um, and so we went a couple of times a year to see her. Um, and there was something recurrent. Every time she saw me, she would come and pinch my cheeks, and that's normal for a grandmother, a Jewish grandmother, you know, very hard. Um, I, I actually hated that, I have to say. Um, she pinched my cheeks really hard, then said, note, 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 and started crying every time, no fail. Um, and cried um, really um, from the bottom of her heart. 
I, as a small kid, that was very disconcerting and I did not understand until maybe when I was nine or 10, when my mother finally explained to me. And the story was actually quite sad. Um, so she grew up in Poland um, in the first half of the 20th century. And about in the 1930s, her father, um, my great grandfather, uh, who was called Notte, um, um, send, had the prescience to send her and her sister out of Europe because Europe was going to be a big mess. And, um, and the, so they came to South America. But my grandfather, uh, my great grandfather, was very poor. They were very poor. They were living in a ghetto and couldn't move, um, could, could not live with the rest of the family. And the entire family died at Auschwitz in the gas chambers. <laughs> My grandmother, my mother explained to me, um, cried because my name in Yiddish is not him. So when I was born, that's the name I was given. And so when she said my name, she was remembering her father. And, uh, um, and so the, according to my mother, my grandmother cried because of the memory of my grandfather. So I actually uh, was unfortunate as a small boy having to remind her of this, but this is how it was. The second event I want to tell you about is also kind of sad. Um, and I'm sorry to start with sad stories, but I think the end result is actually OK. <laughs> As a boy um, growing up in Brazil, I was actually pe pretty sickly. You know, I, I had very bad bronchitis, um, actually a result of an allergy to a tree that grows in Brazil, uh, the main tree in Brazil, of all things. Um, and um, in addition, I had developmental dyspraxia, which is a disorder of the brain that uh, makes uh, you be very poorly coordinated. So until about the age of 10, I was not able to tie a shoe or to button my shirt. I hope I buttoned today, actually. Um, but I couldn't. I was very uncoordinated. Um, you know, if I try to run, I'll fall because I'll, my legs will trip on each other. Um, and so. For the other kids, I was very weird. I was very fat. Of course, I couldn't do exercise. I mean, it was difficult. Um, and I couldn't do exercise because I couldn't breathe and I couldn't do sports very well, um, which is a pity because I love soccer. Um, so anyway, um, so I was the kid in the school that was always bullied, um, always. Since I was about six until I, uh, about 14 or something, they, they, this was the weird kid. Um, and. Uh, it was very bad um, growing up. I was, um, um, you know, I have, a, I, had, I have to say this, this event made my childhood really difficult. Um, but as a result, what happened is that I started to clump up. I think it's normal for people to, to escape society at this moment. So I, I, I stayed in my room. I, I, I had a lot of books um, and I read a lot. Um, even as a small kid, it was easy because it was easier to be with books than to be with people. Um, and I um, slowly began um, loving more and more ideas and less and less people. Um, and so by the age of uh, 15 or 16, I, um, I, that's how I was. I was incredibly shy. I wouldn't talk to people. I didn't know how to relate to people. And I was um, very idealistic. Um, Idealism for me had a big impact in my life. Um, and that's actually the first message I'll have for you going forward. And I think it was actually a positive thing. So, so two things I want to mention, and that's related to the story I told you so far. The first thing is that because of my grandmother, um, I became very strongly Zionist. Uh, I thought that what I had to do in life was to leave Brazil and go live in Israel, uh, because that's a place where Jews could be safe. Um, and uh, and uh, my dream was, of course, that to be a um, perfect society for, you know, for, uh, for f at least for the people that, uh, that will live there. Um, I was a small kid, and so by the age of 16, I began preparing to leave. I did all my paperwork, and by, when I finished high school at 17 and a half, I went to Israel um, alone. My family didn't go. My family always said that it was going, but they stayed. Um, and um, my mother, of course, didn't want that, so she tried to bribe me. She offered me a car. Um, the, um, I, I almost took it, but um, <laughs> that was a testament to my idealism. Anyway, um, 
Idealism was one thing, reality is another. I have to say I was scared to death. I went to that plane. I, I did all the things that a teenager would do. I, I boarded the plane. The plane took off. I literally cried halfway to Israel, I think. The poor flight attendant was so worried because I was a kid crying on the flight. And so she'll come every five minutes. Oh, do you need anything? Everything's OK. I mean, she was, it was uh, now thinking about it. It was quite funny, I have to say. <laughs> The second thing was that because I was so clamped up in books and studying all the time, um, of course, I began developing ideas of what I wanted to do with my life. And, and, and science became an answer. I, I thought, naively, but believed it, that if science would be the way, perhaps, to illuminate society. You know, if you could explain to people in the Middle Ages that, you know, uh, scientific facts, perhaps they would not do witch hunt. You know, perhaps if, 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 if Nazis understood better um, people, then they would not have a holocaust. Or, or things like this. This is how I thought, right? Perhaps if I could tell my friends what this, you know, developmental dyspraxia was, they wouldn't pick on me. You know, something like this. And so I thought that. And I decided that I was going to study science. And so those two things, I was very clear from the age of 16, 17. I knew exactly where, that I was going to Israel and I was going to study science. Israel was very transformative. Um, the first thing I did when I got there was I went to live in a kibbutz. Uh, kibbutz is a collective farm um, and which I work in the morning and learn Hebrew in the afternoon. Um, so that's good because I could, you know, get my, make my living while studying. Um, in the morning, we will wake up every day at four. Um, it was a shock to me because I was still a teenager, so waking up at four was not easy. Um, and do all kinds of things. I pick oranges, I pick potatoes, I picked uh, cotton. I work in a factory. They were making irrigation devices. Um, I work in the kitchen of the kibbutz, which was communal kitchen. I mean, there are 600 people, and the pots and pans were so big that you actually had to go inside them to clean them. So it was just amazing. It was just pretty interesting. And the best jobs, um, in terms, um, at least of folklore, is that I, sometimes I had to go do garbage collection, um, go around with a tractor and car collect garbage. And the best one, I had to go to the turkey pen to clean their poop. <laughs> I tell you, there is nothing better for creating bonds between people to waking up at 4 in the morning to clean turkey poop. <laughs> It's, you know, um, you, you, you know each other. You learn these people. You have to talk about something when you're doing this. <laughs> and people really treated me great. You know, the life in the kibbutz was very transforming. I know having grown up in, in a place where I was bullied all the time to a place where people were so kind to me um, was... Um, was very transformational. You know, by the end of my six months, my attitude towards people have changed completely. I, I began trusting them again. I, I, I love people um, since that time. And it was all thanks to kindness. Um, and, you know, I actually wrote this, this, um, this um, quote from the Dalai Lama, I, which, I, which I think I take to heart, especially from my kibbutz um, period, uh, which, um, when he says that there is no need for temples, no need for complicated philosophies. My brain and my heart are my temples, my philosophy is kindness. I think this is actually one of the deepest lessons I learned from the people I worked with um, in the kibbutz, and, and really, you know, I, I can hear talk to you because of that time, I think. From the kibbutz, I went to the university, study. I, um, you know, I, I knew from the beginning what I wanted to study. I wanted to study the brain. Um, uh, this was clear to me, in part because I thought that was the ultimate frontier um, in terms of knowledge, uh, in part because we are our brains. And so I, I said, well, if I can understand the brain, I will understand people. <laughs> and so that's how I, I, I went. Um, I, I knew I wanted to do something in computational neuro, neuroscience or neuroengineering because the brain is very complex. You know, if you think in terms of, you know, there are 100 billion neurons in the brain alone. Um, and if you actually look at number of connections, there is a quadrillion connections in the brain. It's a very complex device. You know, just to give you an idea, it's 60 times larger than the depth of the United States. 
the, the, the number of connections. And, and so you know how big our debt is, so you can have an idea how bad this is. So I thought, well, we need theories, we need models, and I uh, wanted to study this. And so what I did is I, th there was no engineering in my university. I studied at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. So I went to do um, physics and mathematics. I had a double major in physics and math. Um, and, and then later I took biology. So that's was sort of how I got to computational neuroscience through, through this, this, um, this, this path. Um, I love physics. I love math. I love biology. To me, um, and, um, and, and, I, and I say something else, at that time, given my idealism that the purpose was to illuminate people. Uh, it did not matter to me whether the, the ideas had application or not. Um, I mean, I, um, beauty was all that was required. I, um, you know, so if, if, when I study about supernovas, I was actually thrilled. Uh, you know, supernovas have very little impact in our lives, but we know that this is how the, the, the molecules that compose our bodies are formed. And, and this sort of takes away the, the relevance of people. Yeah? And this is important, meaning it makes us more humble to know how small we really are. Uh, Darwin um, theory of evolution was another example. I thought it was fascinating because, um, again, it's important in many things. It's important in medicine, you know, you tell us how to take antibiotics or whatever, but the most important thing is we are not that special as a species. Um, and to me, this was a really important finding in terms of illumination. We, we should not take ourselves so seriously. Uh, it was the message I was getting. And that was important. So I love this. Then I said, OK, I finished my undergrad. I went to do my PhD. Um, I did my PhD in the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And later I came and I was a postdoc um, in a research faculty at MIT for, for seven years. I, um, I focused my research on one branch of neuroengineering, um, which was the visual system. I um, studied um, first in Israel um, how photoreceptors work. These are the cells that when light comes, they will transform light energy into electrical and chemical impulses that the brain understands. So that was my, my first work. And then I went to MIT and uh, continued doing other things. I studied networks of cells that have, um, that, that um, perform calculations on images, um, that extract information from those photoreceptors. So two topics, I, I work on many things, but two things that, um, uh, that I'll mention because it's relevant to what I'm going to tell you. One was uh, motion. I was very interested in how cells in the brain calculate movement in the world. So when you have a motion in front of your eye, these photoreceptors are activated sequentially. Right? So, so, so one after the other after the other. The brain sort of looks at the sequence and can, can calculate things like how fast the motion is going and how, you know, where is it going and so on and so forth. So we spend some time trying to figure out answers to these questions. Um, the other thing that I was very interested in was the, the, the fact that you, when you go to a room um, and, um, and, and it's dark in the room, so suppose you, you are at night and you turn off the light of the room, so in the beginning you don't see anything, and then a minute or two later, or, or three or five, or whatever number of minutes, suddenly you are seeing things in the room. And the reason for that um, is that you, you know, the room is not changing. You simply turn the light off, so there is nothing in the room that's changing. It's your brain that is changing. So I was very interested in mechanisms in the brain that would change to adapt to the new environment. To me, those two topics, among many other things, were very revealing. I was very happy to be helping understand the brain, but also to realize that the brain is very limited. You know, we are in love with our brains. Um, um, Woody Allen said in a movie that the brain was his second favorite organ. <laughs> um, so we are in love with our brains. We are very anthropocentric. We tend to think we are really special. But when you look at the brain, the brain is a very limited device like any other device. It has great power, but a lot of limitations. So for example, in the case of movement, cells 
have to use carbon. They, they use their own special proteins, and they tend to be very slow. If you compare to, 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 to a computer chip, our calculation of motion is very retarded, very slow, and so you cannot really calculate speeds very well. You cannot calculate accelerations very well. We are very poor in those things. Um, if you, um, other species are a lot better. If you take a fly, uh, to a movie with you, um, then uh, you are going to be able to see the movie because you, you are so slow that you blend the images, right? But the fly visual system is much faster. To him, the movie will look like a slideshow. Um, and so we, our brain is limited. You know, we, the, the adaptation that I was mentioning before is actually necessary in the brain because our uh, the cells respond to such a narrow range of values that when you have a lot of light, um, it's the, you, you will use the entire range. And so you go to dark, in the dark of the room, you, the cells will saturate. They will not respond. And so the brain has to change, sort of, to put this range back in place. So to me, this was fitting my own personal uh, philosophy of science very well. Because, I, because if our brains are limited, um, then we are not that special. We should not think of ourselves so, so highly. And, and therefore, again, bring a certain degree of humility um, to us um, as people. And so I was very happy doing that research because I, I could see the consequences, at least philosophical consequences. And then life happened. Um, and by, me, by that I mean you grow up and, and, and you live life um, and you learn new things. And then you realize that some of the things that you believe are not necessarily, the ideals that you hold are not necessarily correct. Um, so for example, um, I'm not, not sure how many of you know that the Nazis actually um, believed um, and used the theory of evolution for their own purposes. So the theory of evolution is a very good theory. But they thought that they could select a superior race the same way we make better cows. Um, and so the science is there, but at the same time, the values did not go with the science. They chose to use the science information in different ways. Um, and we see this in our society all the time, right? For example, stem cell research um, is, uh, is, is a promise of cure for millions of people. And yet, the values that a lot of sectors of our society use say, well, we shouldn't do it because embryonic stem cell is unethical. And, and I'm not criticizing, but this is the point. There is a science and there is the values. Um, I was thinking about um, gay rights. You know, Now it's strong in the news because of the Supreme Court debate last week. Um, so. Science has been bringing stronger and stronger um, piece of evidences that, um, that being homosexual has biological roots. And that uh, has you know, increasingly more clear. Um, but um, we, as a society, can use this in different ways. Some people say, well, if, it, if it's a biological characteristic, then we should not discriminate against them. Because, I mean, different people have different biological characteristics, color of skin, um, gender, etc., and we, we shouldn't discriminate according to biological characteristics. Other people say, no, 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 the value should be superior. We should not discriminate because everybody should have their own right regardless of choice. It doesn't matter how you are, the reason why you are almost sexual, that would be the argument. And then, of course, there is the other faction that says, well, you know, Bible says uh, perhaps uh, being homosexual is bad, uh, uh, um, and then, therefore, let's not give them rights. I mean, you could argue this in many ways. And you can see that the information is there, but the use of the information depends on values that are beyond science. And so I began to realize that my idealism had to evolve, and it did. Um, I, I do no longer thought that by doing science, I would actually influence values. Uh, that was not, um, not um, any longer what I thought. But I do think, and this is a message that I want you to keep, that idealism continues to be important. You should do good. You should strive to perfect the world. Your idea of what is good could change. It's not necessarily constant, as mine wasn't. Um, and, 
And, um, but, but when you believe what is good, you should go after it. And you should go after it not expecting necessarily that you are going to finish the job. It's just simply doing the job all the time. I actually got another quote, this one from the Talmud, actually, Prikei Avot, the, the Ethics of Fathers. Um, and it says, tra translated to English, it's not your responsibility to finish the work of perfecting the world, but you are not free to desist from it either. It's just what we have to do. So now, I continue to believe, my ideals have changed, but I continue to believe that they should actually push me forward to, to, to work in this area and improve the world. So, so just to summarize what, what has happened to me since, since this change, um, I um, my, my career has changed a little bit. As a scientist and as a chair of department, um, I not necessarily think that um, that all the research that I do um, have to have some some beauty, I, I, uh, or, or, or I, all the research have to have beauty, but be guided purely by beauty. Importance to society is really um, is major. So in biomedical engineering, of course, we develop technologies that are helpful um, to a, to a lot of people. Prosthetic devices, um, new cures for all kinds of diseases, new diagnostic tools, um, and I think that's very important. Um, the lab has certainly changed a little bit what it does because um, to go more and more to to develop new new tools. Um, as a chair, of course, we look always to improve the department. We want to bring people that think in this manner um, and people that will interact with each other uh, in a way that the department can get closer to the patient and, and help people that are needing these technologies. Um, we have, in fact, a grant that we receive a, um, about a year and a half ago called from the Coulter Foundation, where we actually give money in the department to encourage people to take their ideas to the bad side. And that has, I think, been quite transformational in the, in the, um, in the department. As a teacher, I already said what I believe. To me, being a teacher is really important, both in the classroom and in the lab. Uh, my son is here, and you will confirm that um, the reason, probably, probable reason I like to teach in the classroom is because I like to talk. And they say I talk too much. Um, and so, uh, I mean, I won't, uh, I won't um, say no, I'm probably right, um, even though I didn't say anything. <laughs> uh, but to me, the important thing in the classroom is to inspire. It's not so much about knowledge. I mean, yes, I will give you knowledge in the classroom, but, but I want to inspire you. I want to endow you with passion um, and, and pursue um, of a new, new field, if possible. Um, I so the analogy would be, I'd rather light your fire than fill your bucket. I really want you to feel um, the desire to do this. To me, there is nothing better, and, and I can see the students are here, than having a student come to me and say, you know, this class really changed the way I view things. I am going to do research in such and such area. It's a fantastic feeling. It's the best thing you can have as a, as a teacher. In the lab, um, in the lab, teaching research is different. Um, you know, you have to do it by example. There is no single formula. But what's very important is that everyone in the lab is different. Some people um, have different personalities than others. Some people come from different cultures. So everybody in the lab is different. My goal as a lab manager is to make sure that they develop their strength unique to them um, and unique to their culture. And to me, this is sort of important. I, you know, I already said I am Brazilian. And I feel Latino, actually. The things I like are very Latino. Um, but I'm Jewish at the same time. And recent times, I, be, I became somewhat Buddhist. Um, and so I have all of those things in me. But I think all of those values are important because creativity comes by looking at a problem from different angles. You have a problem. And, and if you have different people with different ideas and different backgrounds, that's how we're going to be creative in finding solutions. So, so it's very important to me to encourage every one of them uniquely. So it's a hard job, actually, teaching in the lab. The last thing I want to say is what these experiences, how this experience affected me as a person. Um, and I think um, the main message that I try to tell you is 
What matters to you changes all the time. Um, you know, as I said, to me, I had some ideals when I started in college. I have different ideals now, um, and, and 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 that's okay because not just what ideas, but also people are constantly changing. You know, we are we our relationships um, are, are are changing all the time. You are, we are maturing in different ways. Um, our the ways we think about um, some problems are changing. What's important to you may be changing. Um, and so my main advice as person, and this is what I try to do, is I try not to get hung up on those changes. The changes are actually part of it and very important. You, you, you don't grab to some idea and say, this is what it's going to be. The new idea is as good as the previous one. Um, I try to do good um, based on the new idea. Um, but but knowing that we are always changing and we are uh, and 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 we have to embrace those changes and and i'll finish with a thought i had this thought to, actually when preparing um, this this presentation um my mother told me that my grandmother cried because she was sad for for her father for my great grandfather i actually beginning to think that perhaps my my mother had it wrong my grandmother was very wise, uh, and perhaps she knew what I was talking about now, and she knew that ideas and people are renewing themselves all the time. And perhaps she saw me not as a memory of her grandfather, but as renewal of her father. Perhaps I was just a new note, which I am, um, a new um, person that emerged, despite the fact he died, it reappeared again. OK. So this is my main message to you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and I'm told I'm supposed to take questions. And it's 12.42, and I think we have an, another eight minutes. If you have questions, I'm happy to take any questions. Just so raise your hand, and I'll give you this mic. Anyone? <laughs> I guess everybody's in shock. <laughs> so I take one. Uh, when you were younger, why do you always think about moving to the Israel for your study? What is the reason? No, I, so um, Shifa, um, it wasn't that I thought. I mean, I, I could have studied in Brazil um, also. I mean, I, in fact, I, I, I did entered the university in Brazil. I, I just didn't go, take any classes. Um, it was my thought that in Israel, I would be able, you know, um, uh, th that what happened to my family wouldn't happen again. Because it's a Jewish society. Um, we, um, we wouldn't be persecuted. We would take control of, of our lives. Um, you know, um, yeah, and this I didn't mention, but it's important. I love Israel. Um, you know, I didn't go back there because eventually I, I, I met my wife here. <laughs> we got married, and and we decided to settle here. But um, but I love Israel. And at that time, as a young boy, you know, see, I was 17. Uh, I, I, I think myself um, as as a young teenager. I I, I thought that um, that Israel was going to be a, 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 an ideal society. You know, again, we are, when we are young, we are very idealistic. Um, and Israel was great, but it is a society like any other society. Um, the thing is that people there are very warm. I always felt a lot of warmth and, um, and, the, and the example given on what happened in the kibbutz. But it is, at the end, just a society like any other. I can expand on that if you want, but not needed. I had a question. Sure. You mentioned in Israel, in the kibbutz, you saw a lot of kindness, and that shaped you. Um, if you can imagine for a minute that you didn't see that type of kindness in the kibbutz, um, can you, do you think you'd be here today, and how do you think that would have shaped your life? 
I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm an optimist, and I think I would be here today, or um, at least um, at USC or, or doing science. You know, the kibbutz was the first place where I felt it very strongly because, you know, of course, my family was um, very nice to me, um, but these were strangers, and that kind of love, without actually requiring any anything back, was just completely transformative. And I think going through life, I, I, I met many people that that have that kind of approach to life. So so I am hopeful and I think I would have found someone else. The kibbutz was the first place where I felt it. But um, but, I th but I think I would. You know, in some respect, um, this is part of what I try to put in my teaching or in my classes. Um, I, of course, I, I think of the students as, as the future. And and the good that I hope I can do, it's the same good I hope they can do. Um, so I hope that, but I try to give from me without actually expecting anything back. I mean, I, um, hopefully one of them will um, take this and, 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 and spread this around. So I, I, I'm optimistic. I think I would have found someone. <laughs> uh, hello. I have a question. You mentioned that as a youth, your ideals were very strong, but as you grew older, they changed. Do you still think that science can solve a lot of today's social problems? Oh, social problems. OK, so these are two things. I think science can solve a lot of um, a lot of problems because technology helps. Um, you know, one of the perhaps um, most uh, important problems, I, I, I can give you many, but l t take the issue of aging. Society is becoming old very quickly. Um, in, in parts of Europe, the birth is one child per woman. In China, has been by law one child per, per woman. Um, um, and that means that people are getting old as, as an average. So, um, and so you think, well, this is going to be a really bad problem pretty soon um, because there'll be, it's difficult to take care of that many people. Um, but society has, um, for example, in biomedical engineering or in gerontology, uh, look for ways to solve um, the societal problems. Um, you know, we have better ways to make food, we have ways to clean water and have better hygiene and so on. So I think society has solved a lot of problems. Um, but what you do with the knowledge, and this is what I was trying to say, the values that you put are independent of the knowledge. Um, and th this is what I, I feel nowadays. You have you can develop a lot of technology, we, and we are. We are developing a lot of technology very quickly, but we need to develop ourselves as humans um, in parallel. It's not enough just to go and, and build new machines. You have to know how you're going to apply this knowledge and this technology. This, is, this was part of what I was trying to say. Uh, first of all, I really enjoyed your talk. Thank you. Uh, secondly, I mean, you talked a lot about how your value or how values in general and, and scientific achievements kind of, you know, color the way that they're used. Uh, so I want to know how you mesh your scientific views with your views on human existence and spirituality. I'm not sure I understood the question, but I'll try to answer what I did understand. Um, I. Um, as I said, the, the, my, my impression of what I do as a scientist and as a, what I do as a person have evolved. Um, um, now, um, I believe that we, we as scientists um, can and should still look for knowledge for the sake of knowledge because we never know what's going to be important. But we need to think more and more in terms of what application the knowledge has to help people outside yourself. Um, and so doing science to do good to people, it's something that I, um, I develop for myself and I believe in this. Um, and so um, in some respect that shapes the type of science I do. I used to do only 
what's called fundamental science, just looking for knowledge about how the brain works, for example. Nowadays, we have a, a big fraction of the lab looking for using that kind of knowledge, but now to try to cure diseases. So it has shaped how I approach science. I, I, I hope I answered your question. I wasn't so sure whether that was a question. And I think it's 12.50, so I was told I should stop. But thank you so much. I, I'm really touched that you were all here. So as we all go back to the job of perfecting the world to the degree we can, let's all thank Norberto once again for this moving and illuminating talk. And this happens to be the final meeting of the semester, so we hope to see you all next semester for the next What Matters to Me and Why. Thanks again, and have a great day. Thank you.